address to you today. I am uh, very grateful for this community. Today's presentation uh, is titled Forever at Peace Now. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about a personal story. When I was a little kid in Iran, and there was a war and revolution and what have you seven or eight years of age, and I wanted it all to end. I uh, saw my mom and dad praying, and sometimes I would pray alongside of them. Other times I would watch cartoons, and, and in the cartoons there was always a genie, that you had to rub the lamp for the genie to come out. Well, I don't know where in the cartoons of Aladdin they changed the rules, where you could only get three wishes granted by the genie. Because before that, it was on a limited number, it seemed. And uh, I started digging like the sour um, cherry tree in my backyard. And my dad got pretty upset that it was sort of putting holes in the ground. Uh, later on, he filled it with a sweet cherry tree uh, next to it. I was never able to find uh, the lamp where the genie was. Um, but it, back then, it made me realize that my wishes and prayers cannot be summarized in three. That there are so many things in this world that I wish were different. So I uh, decided as a kid to write a list of the things that I would want to see happen in this world. And I figured every time I prayed with my mom or dad, or you know, of that genie, I refer them to that list and say, I'm only using one of my three wishes. Make everything on that list come true. So I can have two more left for another day <clears throat> and another list. So I want to bring it to today and what's going on in the world. The other day, I was curious, Googling around. So I Googled and I said, do you think the current conflicts meet the criteria for World War III? Are the globe right now in a conflict? This was the answer that Google gave me. According to Google, in order to qualify as a world war, at least one of the three criteria must be met. The conflict takes place between multiple nations across the globe, battles are fought in many different locations, and the war must be fought against great powers with significant advanced technology. I was thinking of Russia and Ukraine and NATO and advanced drones and weapons that are used. I was thinking of the Israel attack on Yemen and Syria and Lebanon and Palestinian territories, targeting aid workers, newspaper journalists, and um, the helpless medical facilities. I was thinking of uh, the Saudi Arabia war in Yemen, the Israel attack on Iran embassy in Syria and Tehran, the catastrophe, the catastrophe that's in Sudan right now with millions starved that doesn't even get mentioned. And the list continued, Ethiopia, Miramar, Mali, etc. So ask yourself, does this qualify for a world war? And if so, if that's not bad enough, we have diseases like polio, cholera, typhoid, now, Mpox. I don't care how big your wall is, if it's the wall of China or the wall we got in Mexico or the Berlin Wall, these diseases do not know boundaries and nationalities and they don't look at your skin color or your religion when they inflict pain. And they go beyond those. So we are at a huge moment in history as to what course we take and what we want to see in this world. And that got me thinking about what are some of the pillars that we need to build in order to have everlasting peace and solidarity and dignity and respect for human life. And I put those three in, in separate buckets and I'm going to walk you through them. One is to go and love. Talked about it at Google more, about its principles. I can highlight the principles. Some of them, one is to love and care for others the way you want them to care for you. And the golden rule that's translated into many religions and faiths. The second is the definition of love. Love is not meant to be unconditional. 
and disciplines their child to make them better. The gardener prunes the tree to make it better. That love comes with knowledge of what that tree needs, what that child needs. It also comes with respect, making sure that tree fulfills its promises and bears fruits, and that child develops in its own image, not a replica of the parent. So respect, knowledge, caring, just like a father would get up in the middle of the night to care for their son or daughter when they're crying, and responsibility to be there for them when they need it the most. Besides those principles of love, there's another principle in Go Love that I've talked about in Go Love, which is the principle of human dignity and human rights and digital rights. In 1948, the United Nations General Assembly came out with human rights principles that applied to all people. And it was more than just a set of rights, it was an actual set of social bonds that the countries in the world agreed to that it would provide for mankind. Um, in terms of the universal declaration of what we are entitled to. And it seems now some people have more rights than others. Some nations have more rights than others. Some religions have more rights than others. Simply based on where they're born, from the genes they inherited, where they came from. That brought me to the whole idea of the sanctity of life, and the goal of more is based on the principle and sanctity of life, and uh, we need to protect that. The th three pillars that I want to talk about that really, in my view, build a pyramid, uh, term, uh, or a three-legged stool, if you will. Besides love, there's the second thing is that we need to hear. We need to hear from the victims. We need to make sure that those stories are told. The parents that have lost kids, the kids that have lost parents in conflicts, in war zones, due to what has taken place all around the world, they need their stories to be heard. I don't know what Candice Khan did, I don't know what happened during the Crusades except the books I read, I don't know how the Arabs invaded Iran and how the Persians invaded the rest of the world to that detail. But I can tell you that over the past 10 months my stomach has turned as I watch the news of what's taking place in the Holy Land. It is the parents and kids that their pleas need to be jotted down and written about. And you say, well, how do we do that? 23 years ago, there was a site that popped up called Wikipedia. And Wikipedia put together over 60,000, 60 million pages of articles. And published pages that people go in and edit. And it's not simply just putting somebody's date to birth and death and the cause of death and what institution or war or corporation or evil entity was responsible for it. But it's also the pleas of the people that survived it and what those pleas are. What does the surviving generation want as a result of the pleas? of um, those kids and those parents that are lost in the war. So, what do we do with this list? Let's say we assume that we gather all this of what has happened in these past two decades, and the wars and the wars of unjust deaths, due to disease, illness, corporate greed. And the question is, what do we do with it? And that brings me to the third pillar of this uh, the stool that we're gonna sit on forever peace. And that's what I call the end of Hanky Panky. And that is to put an end to the people, to the institutions, to the corporations that cause this pain and suffering. To name them, to shame them, to bring them to justice. Yes, we don't have a justice system around the world. There's just one ICC and there's just one ICJ. You hear all these cases, but we need to expand our institutions in order to be able to address the criminality that's taking place around the world. And this is not limited to one nation or one country. And then the Panky Panky is also means ending the support for never-ending wars and never-ending militaries that each of these countries have. 
You see, it's not just in the U.S. Militaries, I mean, defense industry, and military industrial complex hires and employs millions and millions of people worldwide, either in our standing armies or supporting services. What do we do with all this? What do we do to make changes to um, change the underlying systems so that we <clears throat> don't see people suffer? So those are the three legs of uh, what I would see of uh, making some change. And I think the time for it is now. I beg that the time for it is now. We can't keep witnessing the horror of war and these never-ending battles and never-ending wars of power grab and land grab. And people say, uh, I want to have peace. But peace needs to have justice. A peace that does not have justice is only capitulation. If you take the land, the sea, the air, and you put a gun to a guy's head and say, come in for peace talks, what you're asking for is surrender. People need to have at least some basic equal footings before they walk in to ask for peace. And if not, you're not of respecting the basic human dignity. Um, Dr. Beck, Dr. Blake thought I was going to come here and offer a prayer as well. Being an Iranian American, raised Muslim, if I offered a prayer in Islam, they would say, look, a uh, church in San Francisco that was founded, founded by Christians, even though it's a fellowship church, who respects everyone and all ideologies, is having a Muslim prayer. And if I offered a prayer in Christianity, the Muslims might say, well, look, one of the reasons he got taught was because he offered a prayer in Christianity. So uh, I am going to ask you and myself to offer a prayer to the altar, but I'm going to do it in silence. And uh, I'm going to just share one poem with you from Rumi because Reverend seems to quote the Torah. And I uh, come across a me pretty frequently in my days as part of my meditation. And as I read this poem, uh, and I'll end it with a couple of minutes of silence for my prayer, but I want you to think about how many cities around the world this describes. Do we, are these cities in Congo? Are these cities that I'm going to talk about in Africa? cities in the West? If so, how many cities that Rumi describes is around the world? I did change one word uh, in the poem, and you'll notice a new poem. So um, this was what I posted on the revolutionary love can save us. It was when I was talking to Rumi, and uh, he gave me this poem a few times as I said my prayers for him. And it's called The City of Saba by Ruby. In the city of Saba, there is a flood of wealth. Everyone has more than enough. Even the bath filters wear gold belts. Huge great clusters hang down on every street and brush the faces of its citizens. No one has to do anything. You can balance an empty basket on your head and it will fill by itself with overripe fruit dropping into it. A stray dogs stay in lanes full of torn out scraps and barely a notice. The Wall Street desert wolf gets indigestion from the rich food. Everyone is satisfied with all the extras. There are no robbers. There is no energy for crime or for gratitude. And no one wonders about the unseen world. The people of Salva feel bored with just the mention of prophecy. They have no desire of any kind. Maybe some idle curiosity about miracles, but that's it. The overrichness is subtle disease. Those who have it are blind to what's wrong and deaf to anyone who points it out. The city of Saba cannot be understood from within itself, but there is a cure as an individual medicine, not a social remedy. Sit quietly and listen to our voice. That will say 
be more silent. As that happens, your soul starts to revive. Take up talking and your possessions of power. Give up the excessive money. Turn towards the teachers and the prophets who do not live in sorrow. They will help you grow sweet again and fragrant, wild and fresh and thankful for any small.